Welcome to Breaking Convention. precedent today of the speakers that have come before me and some beautiful nuggets uh, of information and ideas that we've had over the course of this morning and of yesterday. Um, one little bit that's, that, that, that really sang out to me was um, Ivan, I don't know if he's still here, Ivan, where he's gone, um, talking about the plants having a voice. Um, this to me is a perfect introduction into the area that I'll be talking about today, which is about understanding reality symbolically, understanding that reality actually communicates with us as much as we communicate with reality, with our surroundings. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about, I don't know if any of you will be a little bit, uh, a little bit alarmed at seeing Terence McKenna and Jorge Luis Borges um, placed together in the same paper. Um, I, think it's, I think it works very well, and I'll explain a little bit about this. I've heard over the course of this, uh, over today and yesterday, Various people saying things such as, um, you know, I've been smoking cannabis since I was 14, or I've been taking LSD since I was 15. Well, in my case, I've been reading Borges since I was 15, and I think that that has been uh, more of a groundbreaking and, uh, and culture-breaking uh, uh, activity than probably any uh, amount of, uh, of LSD. Um, well, it can be equated to that. So. Uh, so I'd recommend, uh, Borges is not for the faint-hearted, I'd certainly agree with that. Um, and I've been reading Terence McKenna and listening to Terence McKenna um, since a fateful morning walking up to uh, university with Cameron, and he mentioned something about the time wave theory, um, and uh, that was a number of years ago. And uh, although I held the two in fairly separate compartments of my mind, it all came together with one of uh, Loren Lorenzo's, um, Lorenzo Haggerty's podcasts, um, in which the tremendous author Tom Robbins, and I don't know if anyone has read Tom Robbins, but those who haven't, I recommend Tom Robbins. Um, Tom Robbins and Terence McKenna were rapping together, and they talked about Borges. And I was, uh, I was blown out of my chair with this, because there were three people whom I held very dear to my heart. Um, Tom Robbins, Terence McKenna, and there they are talking about Borges. So it kind of, the whole thing came together. But of course, it comes together much more than that, and this is what I'm going to explain today. And in fact, I'm not going to speak very much. I'm going to read various quotes. I'm going to do a sort of a, a funny patchwork affair today of elements, uh, of quotes of, um, of Terence and Terence, who's uh, the anniversary of his death today. So um, may be enjoying his experience with the machine elves uh, right now. He's probably looking down upon us now as it is. He's probably sitting somewhere in here, actually. Um, so there you are. So Terence. But in particular, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be bringing out elements of Terence, which I think are fairly often overlooked. His extraordinary work as a scholar of literature, his reading of Gnosticism, his reading of alchemy, his understanding of, for example, John Dee, the Elizabethan alchemist and magician, um, the, the English Elizabethan alchemist, um, his reading of James Joyce, in particular Finnegan's Wake, his amazing... Um, ability to read and assimilate and bring into the same symbolic dimension his reading of different authors and different magicians and different philosophers. And I realize, of course, this is it's very similar to the whole uh, drive of Borges, not as a writer, but as a reader. And Borges, as a, as a, 
as an explainer of his own reading and his own incredibly extensive bibliographic reading, um, I see that they're actually very similar. They have this incredible ability to remember huge passages and to bring together in this wonderful patchwork, um, which for Borges I would place under this loose term known as mysticism, and for McKenna I'd put in this loose term, and I mean loose term, known as psychedelics. But of course, as I hope to explain, um, mysticism and psychedelia, or psychedelics, are actually two different words to explain what's essentially the very similar um, conceptual understanding of the universe. So I'm going to shut up a little bit and let them talk. Um, I think the first thing to say that I find present in both Terence and in Borges is the articulation of this astonishing paradox, which is probably at the heart of a lot of what we are doing here today and yesterday. And that paradox is the ceaseless, constant drive to understand something that is inherently ununderstandable. Now, of course, that the paradox lies in the fact that we understand that it's not to be understood, and yet we understand that we continue to try to understand. It's a beautiful paradox, because, of course, you are presented with the obvious situation of saying, well, if it's ineffable, if it's unexplainable, and if it's ununderstandable, then I may as well just give up and go and watch daytime telly. But, of course, we don't. That's why we're here today. And so when we come to the essential riddle of, of existence and the riddle of the universe, this ex extraordinary paradox of attempting to understand knowing that the ultimate, the ultimate uh, answer to the riddle of, of existence will never be answered. And I can read some quotes here. Like I said, I'll let them speak rather than me. Here's a quote from Borges. Um, if life's meaning were explained to us, he said in Spanish, but I'm uh, reading in English, we probably wouldn't understand it. To think that a man can find it is absurd. We can live without understanding what the world is or who we are. The important things are the ethical instinct and the intellectual instinct, are they not? The intellectual instinct is the one that makes us search while knowing that we are never going to find the answer. And Terence, and I won't try and do his, his crazy elfin accent, um, Terence, here's a lovely quote um, from this podcast, and I don't know if he called it this or Lorenzo called it this, but it's called Muck Nature, which I think is lovely. Living psychedelically, says Terence, is trying to live in an atmosphere of continuous unfolding of understanding, so that every day you know more and see into things with greater depth than you did before. Um, what we get from this also is the understanding that the world is essentially um, a riddle. Um, and there's a lovely little quote here I have from Borges when he was 80 years old, these series of interviews he did when he was 80. And he says, I think of the world as a riddle, he says. And the one beautiful thing about it is that it cannot be solved. But of course, I think the world needs riddles. I feel amazement all the time. And he actually goes into the ex explanation of the word amazement, the English word amazement, which he thinks is better than the, the Spanish word asombro, um, because it has maze within it. So therefore, you're already entering a maze by the use of the word amazement. Whereas asombro has shadow, sombra, within it. So you're, 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 you're sort of lost in this, in this lack of understanding in both cases. Now, what this also leads to is something which, is, which will be very familiar to any readers or listeners of Terence um, and any readers of Borges, which is this sense of a rejection of dogma, a sense that belief with a capital B is itself a highly problematic um, mode of thought, because belief with a capital B necessarily um, excludes other lines of thought. So they're therefore moving away from rigid doctrine, moving away from dogma, is the opening up of a greater sense of tolerance for other lines of thought. And uh, I found this beautifully articulated in, um, in, in Borges as well. And he uses the word agnostic, but agnostic here, well, I'll let him explain. He says, being an agnostic means all things are possible, even God, even the Holy Trinity. This world is so strange that anything may happen or may not happen. Being an agnostic makes me live a larger, a more fantastic kind of world, almost uncanny. 
It makes me more tolerant. Now, I guarantee that you cannot have listened to anything of Terence without hearing him re repeat that phrase which he uses all the time, which is that the universe is not more weird than we imagine, it's more weird than we can imagine. So again, we've got this, this similar perspective of the, the aesthetic joy and the epistemological value of bafflement, of puzzlement, of mystification. That itself is of great, um, as I say, great epistemological value. Um, so with this idea of belief, Terence then brings this into this well-known expression. You can see this as little sort of brief YouTube clips um, of culture being not your friend, because culture being, it's, it's related interestingly to the question that Ollie just raised earlier, um, the idea that culture actually being a defining um, boundary, uh, the, 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 the defining imposition of boundaries. And of course, as we all know, Terence um, spends a lot of time expressing the idea that psychedelics are boundary dissolving. Um, and there's this lovely little quote that I have here about belief. This is from Terence. Um, Much of the problem of the modern dilemma, he says, is that direct experience has been discounted and in its place all kinds of belief systems have been erected. You see, if you believe something, you are automatically precluded from believing its opposite. Now, he's obviously taken quite a hard line there, but he's also quite an iconoclast, so it's, he probably uh, derived great joy from saying such thing. Um, and another thing that Terence says, um, which I think is, again, absolutely beautiful. <coughs> Cultures, he says, that have habitually broken down the cultural illusion and examined the terrifying reality beyond it have not marched off then to pontificate with the religions of absolutism or scientific absolut uh, absolutism or the rest of it. Why is that? is because cultures are virtual realities made of language. And if there is one thing psychedelics do, whether you hate them or love them, whether you don't give a hoot, what they do is they dissolve boundaries, the boundaries between you and the floor, between you and your friend, between you and last week, between you and next week. And they dissolve boundaries. That's what they do. That is ultimately subversive behavior. And again, this perhaps as a link to, uh, to Caroline's talk earlier of, uh, of, of, the, of the subculture, the subcultural dimension, because of course, part, until the subculture has been commodified, that subculture is operating to, to, with the objective, to a certain degree, of breaking down some of the, uh, the imposed uh, boundaries of the hegemonic culture. And as Ollie asked, you know, until of course it becomes commodified as a new cultural more. Um, that's what, Psychedelics do, says Terence. They teach you, we do it this way, don't go there. Sorry, sorry, that's wrong, sorry. That's what cultures do. Cultures are boundary-defining engines. That's what they do. They teach you, we do it this way, don't go there. In your mind, in your heart, follow the rules, follow the rules. Cultures are like operating systems, you know? At Ur and at, well, Ur will do. They set up a stelae in the center of the marketplace, and on the stelae they carve the laws. These were the laws of the operating system called Ur 1.0. And that worked fine for a while. Now we're operating under Clinton's second term 4.0. And is it limiting? I mean, actually, we could think of this as a Hillary Clinton, perhaps. Although he was talking in the 1990s, it, yeah, the same things apply. And is it limiting? Is it idiotic? Is it a pain in the rear end? You bet it is. So that's a, that's a very common feature of people's readings of Terence and also of Borges, of the idea of breaking down the rigidly maintained uh, uh, barriers that, that belief systems, especially cultural belief systems, have set up around us. And this in itself can be expressed through the term of being iconoclastic. Um, now, I think, I think we, can, we can, there are more ways we can look at this. And this is, I think, a very important one here as well. And this, um, this is coming from, an idea that Terence explains about the ethical dimension, and I do think this is important. If psychedelics don't secure a moral community, says Terence, then I don't see what the point of it is. Otherwise, we're just another cult. I mean, I think that's, that's incredibly powerful words. That there is, obviously, 
there is the need, and again it is linked to this idea of, of, of culture and subculture, there is a need to derive value and meaning as opposed to simply setting up a new cultural form which will stand in some kind of opposition to a more dominant cultural form. That's to say, there needs to be the, the expression of, of, of meaning and of understanding from the experience. And of course, as Terence um, was at great pains to explain, one's meaning derives not from one's faith in belief systems, but from the felt presence of immediate experience, from what you experience. Now here, I'll start to enter the, uh, this, this, this symbolic world. Um, <coughs> Borges explains on many occasions that the experience of reading, the experience of, of dreaming, the experience of nightmare, the experience of imagination is as real as the experience of, for example, a tangible empirical um, activity. And indeed he says that he knew London far better from reading Chesterton than when he did when he went there. Well, as it was, he was blind when he went there, so that's hardly surprising. But in any respect, his experiences, as he says, of the dream world are, as, are of as great an importance in his whole cultural development and his whole personal development as his experience of any, um, any let's say, um, material uh, engagement with reality. Indeed, he wouldn't even make, up, make this distinction between a material and an imaginal. The two are, are perfectly equated. And this is of great importance. And I think this is of great importance. This re refers me back to a conversation I've had with Cameron before, which comes to the idea that if we look at medical and scientific um, explanations of psychedelic experiences, there might be, for example, an expression such as the effects of X last for between five and seven hours, or between three and five hours, or between seven and eight minutes, or whatever it may be. Now, I understand my feeling that perceiving the world on a more symbolic basis, we start to become in tune with the fact that the effects actually don't last just five to eight hours, they actually last your lifetime, because they actually will help you change your perspective on how you, in you relate with your your surroundings. But it's more than that as well. It's also about how your surroundings relate with you. And here this brings up the whole um, issue of Jung and synchronicity and how the relationship between psychedelic experiences and synchronicity are of great importance and that we should be attuned to that. We should be attuned to the idea that within the psychedelic experience and beyond the psychedelic experience, and I wouldn't say out of, because I'm, that's what I'm arguing, that there isn't necessarily an out of. It is an understanding that events transpire within reality, which are as meaningful to us as, um, as the dream world, for example, as, as the literature that we're reading, the books we're reading. So there's a lot more I can say about this. There's much more I can say about this. Um, Ah, I'm just trying to think about how to, how to wrap this one up now. Um, essentially, essentially the, the way to bring this together, the way to, to bring this to, together is, is, for me, the, this conflation of mysticism and psychedelics and psychedelic experience is, I find, of great importance here. Now, of course, we've got one of the works that I've been engaged on in the last few months is Borges' reading of Swedenborg. Swedenborg, who was a, uh, um, a mystic who traveled to the angelic world and talked with angels. Now, Borges places great value upon Swedenborg and upon Swedenborg's journeys. And as the same is true of, for example, Rick Strassman's assessment of the interactions that people have under DMT with the entities, um, or the machine elves, as Terence calls them. Now, of course, although, as Graham Hancock has done, and probably he'll talk about this this afternoon, there is this, this, there's, a, there's a whole body of literature which is looking at this <coughs> relationship between mysticism and psychedelia. The important thing there is the fact of the psychedelic society, as Terence calls it. The psychedelic society is not the society in which everyone is loaded on DMT uh, 24 hours a day at all. 
And indeed, neither is it the society where, as, as, as Ras Bingi said earlier, where, for example, everyone smokes the herb at all. But it's the society which gives value to the experiences of those who do. And it's a society that gives value to the encounters that people have and the, the, the learning that people engage with under these experiences. And of course, this again relates to the various conversations we've had about drug policy and the law, because one of the key features of drug policy is giving no value to those experiences, suggesting that such experiences are worthless. Now, of course, in the same way that we can give value to the experiences, let's say, of William Blake or Emanuel Swedenborg, as I've been reading in Borges, in the same way that the psychedelic society, as Terence calls it, would be the community that gives value to those experiences. I'm going to end there because I could just keep rambling for ages. So there we are. <laughs>